Welcome to the wrap up of my June 2021 monthly breakdown. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm 19. I read way too much YA and I read 51 books in the month of June. Also, I got vaccinated today. I got my second shot. So like we're excited. Today's a good day. If you're new to these videos or if you're old to these videos, I'm changing the layout a little bit. So let me explain to you how this video is going to go because no, I am not wrapping up all 51 books in this video, mostly because that would take a lot of time. And also there's a lot of like books in the middle that I kind of feel met on. And I don't want to waste your time on my books and I can definitely like the best of the best and the worst of the worst. If you did want to see me wrap up all of the in-between books I don't talk about here though, I will do that if this video gets to 30 likes before the end of the month. So normally the way I structure this video is I talk about like statistics about what I read and then I give brief updates on my current work in progress writing wise and then I talk about the actual reviews. I'm flipping things up, partially because I actually finished my manuscript this month, so I was too excited to give you brief updates, and that's its own video. I filmed because I got sidetracked the first time I sat down to film this one. So that's up here, because I would have posted it before, because it would have been a lot easier to edit. It's very casual, it's not my normal style of content. Stick around if you want my normal style of content. Um, reason number two it's going to be different is I've actually decided that I want to try putting the stats and stuff at the end because I do know that the mass majority of people who come looking for like wrap ups are looking for the actual reviews and not me being like I liked this like 0.5% more than I did last month. You know, well I love those parts and I hope other people do because they're my favorite parts to film. Um, I recognize that you might not want to stick through that if you're not into numbers and graphs and statistics. So moving swiftly then into our reviewing section, here's how that's going to go. I'm going to be wrapping up the 10 best and the 5 worst books I read this month. I'll talk briefer on the 10th to 6th best book I read, then I'll alternate between the 5 worst and the 5 best. I read mostly digital, so I won't be holding up any hard copies. I'll be putting pictures of the books on this side of the screen. One last reason this video is going to be slightly different. So I'm an English major and my school put out their list of English courses for the next academic year. And because of that, I decided I was going to go through and read all the books that were listed by name so I knew what courses I would vibe well with. So normally while I read a lot of YA, there's also a lot of not YA on this list and a few of them ended up in my top 10, so good for them. I will not be giving you spoilers. I might in my bottom five because sometimes if like I really want to rant about something and I don't think anyone should read it anyways, I will spoil it. Um, but if I'm going to in my bottom five, I'll let you know so you can skip ahead to when you see the next book on screen. So the 10th best book I read was These Deadly Games. It was an ARC I received and it doesn't come out until February 1st of 2022. These Deadly Games is a very fast paced YA mystery following a teen girl who starts getting a lot of sinister messages saying that harm will come to her little sister if she doesn't complete a series of increasingly evil tasks. At first they seem innocent enough, but she realizes that the person behind the phone who's been texting her this whole time is willing to kill people in order to get what they want. It's a very easy plot to get hooked on and to get wrapped up for. Um, the plot alone, like just trying to keep your kid's sister from dying, makes it very easy to write a rootable for protagonist. So that was great. My only real gripe here is that at the beginnings, especially, she gets a lot of puzzles from this mystery person and she solves them. She doesn't get any of the puzzles wrong ever. She solves them all immediately. And I wish just like more time was given between the puzzle being introduced and her solving it. So like we as readers could maybe try to solve it or she could feel like a more real character who, who wasn't preparing for like this very, very unlikely situation her whole life. I'll bet that it was good. The plot twist was not talking to me, but I think that's only because I read a book with the same plot twist and similar plot layout recently. I read so many books though you won't be able to guess what it is. So I promise I didn't ruin the plot twist. Next up we have The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner which is one of the things I read for class. It's a long form poem uh, and I really enjoyed it. Little, little known fact about me uh, that I probably should share online. I have the entirety of the Jabberwock just memorized for literally no reason. I've had it memorized in sixth grade and I will randomly recite it sometimes normally when I'm home alone like a weirdo. So when I say that this poem feels like Dr. Seuss meets the Jabberwock with like more adult like themes, like not adult, like you'll read it and be like, this is inappropriate, but it deals with like killing a creature and just like the guilt, why did they do it? What's the guilt of this? You know, that kind of thing. Like that's the highest level of praise I could possibly give because I love the Jabberwock. I don't know why. At number eight, we have The Undying Tower, which I got an e-arc of, and it comes out on October 7th of this year. So The Undying Tower is the first, and what I'm assuming is going to be a dystopian YA trilogy. 
um, mostly because it is very tropey, um, but in a way that's very tropey for a dystopian YA trilogies specifically, not just for dystopia or not just for YA or not just for trilogies. I think it was a good introduction. My favorite thing probably was how realistically I think our protagonist handles being thrust into like the whole all sci-fi trilogies do it where you're suddenly the whole world is on your shoulders and everything you knew was a lie and the government was fooling you this entire time she actually like stumbles with it a few times uh which I liked because it's kind of a lot when that all happens to a character and they're just entirely cool throughout the whole book uh that being said a lot of side characters here I wish were more developed but like I said I'm assuming this is the beginning of some form of series. It definitely isn't the only book in this series, so I'm assuming that they will be more developed in later books. I got a digital review copy of Rising Out, but it's already out. It's been out since December, I think. So Rising Out is a high-low book, which means they're books that are written to be of high interest to the demographic they're for. This one is for YA readers, while also being at a lower reading level or just being easier to read. So people can maybe struggle with reading or maybe just don't have as much time to read, or maybe just aren't that familiar and comfortable with reading, are able to still read stories that are targeted at them instead of being targeted at lower audiences, which I think is absolutely awesome. This one's written in verse, and I can't believe I haven't read more high-low books written in verse, because it makes so much sense to me, because most books in verse are automatically shorter, um, and it follows our protagonist, Anaya, who is going on this road trip for school. She has like her whole life figured out, or at least Anaya's mom has her whole life figured out with her best friend, um, but unbeknownst to their families back home, her best friend is actually a trans woman. So at home, everyone thinks Anaya is straight, um, her friend is a cis guy, and that like maybe there's something between them. But in actuality, Anaya has a crush on her trans female friend, and it's the two of them going on like a road trip and just kind of dealing with what that means for both of them like Anaya most of it is her trying to like support her friends and understand what it's like for a friend but at the same time like when her friend does come out people are gonna know Anaya's not straight so it's it's a lot as they go on their road trip Anaya falls harder and harder for her friend now that her friend can finally like express herself and it's her dealing with that her dealing with familial expectations and pressures her trying to be supportive to her friend who's obviously like in a bad situation and also her coping with the fact that like, oops, if she tells her family that she likes said friend, she'll also be in maybe a bad situation. Next up we have When You Get the Chance by Emma Lord, the author of Tweet Cute. If you recognize that name, I wonder where it was from. I know it always bugs me when I recognize author names and can't remember where they're from. I got an e arc of this one. It comes out January 4th, 2022. So When You Get the Chance is Mamma Mia for theater kids. And I know what you're thinking. Mamma Mia's already for theater kids, Alex. That makes no sense. That's a crap description. But that's literally what this is. It's about this theater kid girl who's in an arch nemesis type relationship with the stage director of all their school shows um, who has never known who her mom was. She finds her dad's online profiles from the past and pins down three women she thinks are her mother and they all happen to live nearby. So she decides in secret she's going to try and figure out which one is her mom. It leads to her rivalry with stage manager dude really, really amping up. Um, she wants to be an actor. A lot of her potential parents want to be actors. There's a lot of musical and play references. Literally a Mamma Mia for theater kids, and I loved it so much. It was so fun. Alrighty, now we're gonna get a little more negative, and we're gonna be alternating between my bottom five and my top five. I'll be putting the bottom five numbers in blue, so you know that I'm not saying they're my top fives. First up, we have Live Wire, which is a graphic novel, like, volume that I got an arc of. Um, and right off the bat, I don't know anything about Livewire. I think she's a pre-established character. That being said, this is the first volume, so I assumed we were gonna be even, like I get superhero things. You understand the world better if you know some of the other characters, but I don't think that with superhero volumes, it should be like you have to know every single character to know what's going on. <laughs> and it wasn't that I got confused. You can definitely still understand what's happening, but the problem is it throws us in in the middle of our protagonist going through a lot and you would empathize with her if you knew her and already liked her as a character, but I didn't. So it's just kind of like bad stuff's happening to this person you don't care about. And by the time you start to care about her, you're far into the volume and it kind of, it's all lost on you. I did not enjoy reading this. The fifth best book I read was The Edible Woman by Margaret Atwood, um, which was one of the things I read for class 
I haven't read anything by Atwood before, so this is my first one, and I think that's why I enjoyed it so much, because um, I was expecting it to be very academic and just like heavy to read, uh, and I was not expecting how like genuinely funny and witty of a writer she was. I feel like that's not something people talk about a lot with that. Maybe they do. Maybe I'm just not watching the right people. But to me, it's always like, this is so deep. It's never like, this was deep, but it was also like very enjoyable to read because of how witty the narration is. And even when like some really dark stuff's happening, the narration is very, very witty, which I love. That's why I read Animal Farm last year and I loved Animal Farm for the same reason. I thought it was gonna be really deep and heavy and it was, but it was also very, very sarcastic and just so witty. Loved it. And then on top of all that wittiness, you get some social commentary. So you get to feel like you're intelligent for reading this book. The fourth worst book I read was Beck Star, which was another graphic novel arc that I think I read immediately after Livewire. I like graphic novels, I promise. I read other graphic novel arcs this month and I quite enjoyed them. They were almost in my top. Um, with Beck Star, I do have to say, the visuals were very, very, very well done. I really, it's a pretty graphic novel. Um, that being said, the story and characters are not so pretty. A lot of it's very underdeveloped. And again, a lot of it's based on the relationships between characters. But we don't really get to see enough to really care about those relationships. And there's also, it's just throwing a lot of characters at you, a lot of world building at you. And the world building felt at best hollow. At worst, I think it was full of plot holes, but I could have been wrong because I never quite connected with the world. So it could have just been that I wasn't picking up on things I was supposed to pick up on. Next up, we have one last stop. And I'm so happy I liked one last stop because, well, I thought that, um, what's it called? Red, White, and Royal Blue was great. Uh, and I understand why people like it. I didn't. I said that totally backwards. I thought it was good, not great. Mostly because I am not a man and I also don't like men. So it's not beyond the queer stuff. Like just the fact that they are queer at all. Um, there wasn't a lot there that I as a reader could relate to, which sucks. Cause a lot of my queer friends, even those who aren't men love men, love that book so much. And I was gonna be so heartbroken if I didn't like One Last Stop. By the way, I listened to this as an audiobook. I forgot to say that I got an arc of it, but I ended up listening to it after the fact because one of the books, uh, my worst book of the month, was also an audiobook arc I got, and it took me all month to get through it. Anyways, um, if you somehow don't know what this is about, good. I'm not going to tell you. And you should not read the description before reading it, and you should not read the genre tags on Goodreads before reading it, because I went in thinking it was a normal contemporary, which made it so much better. And I know so many people I know who have read it said that, like the people who love it the most tend to be the people who didn't know what was going on. <laughs> cause it just makes it, cause like the big reveal, a huge reveal happens, like I'd say a third of the way through the book. Um, and if you've read the description, you already know that reveal. So like the first third feels kind of useless. Don't read the description, please. Okay, the third worst book I read was Bedlam which is the 12th, I think, book in a series. So I don't think I can talk about this one without spoilers. I'm not gonna like spoil anything specific that happens in Bedlam or anything big from the series, but it's gonna be a little spoilery because it's impossible when you're this far down into a series. Anyways, I was a huge Skullduggery Pleasant fan in middle school. I was obsessed with them. There was this poor kid in my class who actually, I don't think he knows this and he doesn't watch these, so it's fine. But there was this kid in my class who fully suggested the books to me because we had to like choose a book from a list to read for um, a class reading thing in like seventh grade. And I originally read I am number four because all my friends were like, you have to read it, it's so good. And I hated it. So I read it very fast so I could read something else instead to do my book report on. I didn't want to talk about I am number four. Sorry if everyone hates me now. Um, and while I was re-looking through this list, this dude in my class was like, oh my God, I used to love those books. They're so good, you should read them. And I was like, oh cool, I will. And like a week later when I was reading them, he was like, wow, I've never met anyone else who read that. And I didn't know how to break it to him that I was literally reading them because he told me to. Um, anyways, he hadn't finished the series. So he started reading them at the same time I was, but because I, at that point, I'm better at spacing out series now. I blow through like entire series in a week. At that point, it was a 10 book series, um, nine book series. At that point, it was a nine book series. I would just like yell at this kid, we weren't even friends. But I would just yell at him to hurry up and finish reading them because our library only had one copy of some of the books. Uh, I don't do that anymore, I promise. Anyways, 
All that is to say, I love the series. I anticipated the series more than anything in my entire existence because I was just like so hooked on them. I was always looking for internet friends to talk about them with because I didn't have people in my real life to talk about these books with. And if you happen to be a Skullduggery Pleasant fan, you know that the ninth book was supposed to be the last one. <laughs> it's literally a conclusion. It's a fine written conclusion. Um, I am of the belief that the books do go downhill in quality as they go on. So I was kind of okay with this series being done. Um, and I think the biggest problem with Bedlam is, and the reason I read to Bedlam, this is the spoiler, I guess, um, is Valkyrie, our main character, is revealed to be bi in Bedlam after most of the fan base being queer, which I thought was cool and I wanted to read up to when that happens, but I don't think I'm going to keep going with this series because if you, again, are part of the Sledrogary Pleasant fandom or whatever, when the 10th book came out after it's supposed to end on the 9th, 10th book's called Resurrection, it felt like a series resurrection and everything I was seeing they added a magic school component so and a bunch of younger characters so everyone I knew that was talking about it I don't know if this is how it was published I can't remember but everyone I knew in all the spheres I was in when we talked about Skullduggery Pleasant were talking about resurrection like it was going to be like the bridge between the original series and the next gen series which would be following our magic school kids even the description and stuff for Resurrection make it sound like this is the last time our main characters are momentarily coming out of retirement to pass on the baton to our new squad. And then I have a feeling Derek Landy caught on to the fact that no one wanted to read about his new characters, which sucks because I kind of wanted to read about his new characters, but I do get like if we had like the, the original squad was magnificent. Um, so from there, the next book, I don't even remember the name of it is literally just mostly Valkyrie again, being like, I'm not, I'm still retired, but also I'm clearly not retired. And a few, like two seeds, literally the character who we all thought was gonna be the main character in the new Next Generation series was like a babysitter in this. And that was his role, he babysits Alice, Valkyrie's sibling. And then the same goes for Bedlam. There's a lot going on and all of it feels kind of pointless. And I don't know if it's just because I'm older, but I used to think these books were hilarious. And I just don't vibe with the humor style anymore. So I'm stopping here and it makes me really, really sad because I want to keep saying that this was one of my favorite series in like middle school, but that feels disingenuous when I can't get make myself get through the rest of the series. Next up we have Braiding Sweetgrass, which I also read for a class and it was wonderful and I'm glad I did. I don't think I'm taking that class though. So I'm not a big nonfiction fan. This was so cool. It's part autobiography, part just like, directions on how to use natural plants like you're learning about them um part social commentary and part just lesson in specifically i'm canadian canadian indigenous culture it's divided into sections that are all based around like a plant because that plants both medicinal and like scientific properties um just telling stories of the author and the people around her and what it means to be indigenous in canada and how being indigenous in canada gets you treated and it's so cool such a cool way to talk about a book because I felt like I was learning about so many things at once and it just made me feel very very smart and also it was so pretty like it I don't think I even mentioned like it's very it's told it sounds like it'll be like very scientific which it is the author is I believe some form of scientist which is what where the whole like science aspect comes in um but the way that scientific terms are used if at all is just very poetic and artful and I loved it the second worst book I read was Sienna, which I got an e arc of. Uh, I was excited for Sienna because it's gay. <laughs> so it's steampunk. It's in this world where there's like cyborgs and the cyborgs are like discriminated against and hunted. And this girl who has this deep dark secret because she was once in love with a cyborg is taken by this rich guy who like takes a bunch of girls and says he's saving them. But he's very clearly like this very cruel, awful, abusive human being. That being said, because of that, some very heavy things are delved into and I don't think any of the characters or any of those things or any of the plot or any of the worlds were developed in a way that justified that. And I'm of the belief that like if you're gonna put heavier themes in your work, there has to it has to be very well done and there has to be a reason for them to be there. And this just felt entirely underdeveloped. Um, there's this big moment, again, I'm not going to spoil, where you're really, really supposed to care about a plot twist, but since the people that plot twist pertains to have literally been developed, like not at all, we've seen them for like three chapters, 
the whole book just kind of felt useless because you realize that that's what it was building up to and doesn't impact you at all. Next up we have Solar Storms, which I also read for a class. Solar Storms, um, I really liked because it gave me like high key, high key Anne of Green Gables vibes, but like more intelligent. No offense to Lisa from Montgomery. I idolized her as a kid, which I know I shouldn't. Her life kind of sucks, but I idolized her anyways. I don't know if it's just because it's Canadian and it's family focused um, and it's like very slow moving. But that's the vibe I got, and that's one of my favorite books of all time, so that means it was a good vibe. Um, this was another book that was mentioned in my courses, I don't know if I said that. So basically, this book follows this young girl, she's Native American, and when she's 17, and like, I think ages out of foster care, I forget, she returns to try and find her family and piece together the mystery of her mother and what happened to her when she was a baby that she can't remember, and from there it's just her and her family, both blood family and found family just going on a quest to try and figure out their own stories and teach her about her own culture and it's just it's so good and it's so well written and I know a few people were complaining because there's like plot holes but to me a lot of the things talked about felt more spiritual than like actual plot things so I would argue that there aren't actually plot holes. The worst book I read was Made the Best Man Win. I mentioned the fact that despite the fact that I was like super super excited to read One Last Stop, um, I didn't listen to it until like I finished listening to it I think the day it came out um, and I normally like to read stuff like that like right away because I was stuck on this book for a whole month. I finished it at the beginning of June um, and I read it from like the beginning of May to the beginning of June. I got so upset, not upset like a lot of problematic stuff happened because it didn't, but I just found this so frustrating, so let's talk about it. So first off, I am a cis neurotypical woman, that means a lot of things I'm going to talk about and a lot of things this book talks about just don't apply to me because it's about two queer boys, one who is trans and one who is autistic. And a lot of the story, hmm, a lot of the story is supposed to be them dealing with those things and we're going to talk about why the fact that it isn't just one thing that let me down. So first off, you can write a story about a trans character and have it not be about them being trans. You can write a story about a character with autism and not have it be about them being autistic. But we also have to confront the fact that the May the Best Man Wins sets up its dual perspective, both perspectives, as that is their main thing and that's the main struggle they're dealing with. It is our trans character trying to become homecoming king even though he's trans and it's our autistic character trying to hide the fact he's autistic and become homecoming king even though he's autistic. I think this book as a whole is a lot of very cool ideas um, without the proper follow through and I think one of the biggest examples of that is um, our character Luca's autism because while the trans storyline is given a lot of time I don't I'm not even going to try to comment on whether I think it's handled well or poorly uh, because I'm not trans I don't know but even as a neurotypical person I can say that Luca's ASD storyline was not handled well. So basically, his inner monologue in the first few chapters is literally just him talking about how his parents don't really accept him for his autism, how he feels the need to hide his autism, and how it's like this big all-encompassing thing. The only times we see his autism affect him are through him saying that he's like bad at reading people, um, which again, autism obviously affects everyone in different ways. So there's no right way to portray that, but it also feels kind of weird when the whole book is talking about how it's such a big deal and then it doesn't really impact him except for like in a few niche situations that are mostly done just for the sake of him and t misunderstanding what our other perspective is saying and then being like it was because of his not like for plot reason it that was a lie it's also brought up in another way where he talks about how the school does not acknowledge his neurodivergence and how that makes it tri difficult for him to take tests and stuff um which you know those are conflicts the fact that he spends so much of his time talking about how autism is like this big awful thing um, and how it's affecting him and how like he can't let anyone find out ever. It's his big deepest darkest secret. There's clearly a lot of self-loathing there and stuff that Lucas has to work through. And same the fact that the school isn't supporting him. That's something that needs to be worked through with his school. Uh, but about halfway through the book, or not even halfway, just after the first few chapters and that's all established, we quickly spend all of our time on Jeremy's storyline, which is fine. Again, not a lot of autistic characters in books have to have their whole stories be about the fact that they're autistic. But it's just the fact that it was set up that it would be and they set up all these conflicts and none of them are resolved and it becomes Jeremy's story. Like we end the book and no change has happened at Lucas's school um, and it's also not like a we tried to make change and nothing happened. That just kind of falls to the sidelines 
so he can be a love interest for Jeremy, which it's so hard to talk about because we need more trans stories. And I'm not saying this story shouldn't have been focusing on his transness, but I'm just saying if they set them up as equal hurdles that both boys are facing and then didn't address one of those hurdles, it felt kind of weird. Same with the fact that instead of him like accepting himself or learning ways that he can cope with his autism in a more healthy way, um, Lucas just stops talking about it. That's how he develops as a character. He starts being like, I suck. And then he ends just not mentioning it ever again for the last section of the book. And a lot of the book was like that. A lot of it is an idea is thrown out, a conflict is thrown out, and it's resolved in a very unsatisfying way. Both of our leads, high key suck, especially to each other. I did not want to see them end up together. Uh, I just did not have a good time. <laughs> okay, and then the best book I read was The Art of Running Away, which is a queer middle grade, and I haven't heard anyone talking about it. So let me tell you why you should be talking about it. First off, like I said, this is a queer middle grade. It's also a queer middle grade specifically about allyship. It centers around our main character whose best friend is queer, whose parents she assumes are really chill with queer people because they're chill with her best friend, um, but whose brother she, she kind of resents because he just abandoned her and straight up left the house at like 16 years old and she never really knew why. She goes on a trip to visit a relative and while there her brother shows up and starts to reveal that things were not as her parents made them out to seem and that he actually left home because he came out to his parents and his parents did not respond in an appropriate way and it's her learning both about him and also like trying and failing to be a good ally and even though she's a kid character all the other characters my favorite characters in this are her brother's roommates are fantastic sit down with her and talk to her in an easy to understand way about some really more complex sides of allyship and what it means to be a good ally and i just thought it was so cool i started crying so many times at this little middle grade book it was wonderful and i like this would be such a good classroom read someone please use it as a classroom read i'm begging you did i get an arc of this and not say it sorry i did in fact get an arc of this it comes out on november 16th though so maybe a classroom read for your class next pride month that is the end of the reviewy stuff i'm realizing i think i talked for longer than i normally do so i don't think I'm so torn because I love statistics. I'm gonna try not doing statistics on this video. If that hurts your feelings and you're still watching this part of the video, please let me know it hurt your feelings. So I feel like people actually want me to do statistics because I have a feeling like if I look at my watch time, people are skipping over that. <laughs> That's the main reason it's a lot of work to put together my graphs and stuff, which I still have put together for me, but I don't know if I should be summarizing it or maybe I should just summarize them at the end of the year. Let me know what you think about that. Um, have you read any of these books? Are you going to? You should. Did you totally disagree with me on the books I didn't like, especially on um, May the Best Man Win? Because like I said, I am 0% either of those characters. Like I'm not even the same gender as either of them. So maybe I totally misread all the things I thought were them being crappy teenage boys or just how actual teenage boys really act. God, I hope not. Anyways, I'll see you next Tuesday-ish. Bye.